And welcome to an episode, uh, this latest episode of the Bull and the Bear podcast here on Money and Markets. I'm Matt Clark. Glad, uh, glad you're with us today. Uh, I've got a lot of great topics to talk about, uh, but first let me remind everyone that you can catch the Bull and the Bear on a lot of different channels uh, of late. You can catch us on Apple Podcasts. You can catch us on Google Podcasts. We are also on Spotify. We're on iHeartRadio. There are, I, I was looking last week and I found that we, there are about 20 different podcast aggregator channels that we're on and uh, more than half of them I didn't even know. So um, whatever your podcast listening uh, uh, choice is, you can probably catch us on it. Uh, and we'd love you to leave a review, leave a comment, leave a question. Uh, you can also email us uh, with the podcast, the bull and bear at moneyandmarkets.com. Uh, that's the bull and bear at moneyandmarkets.com. And uh, you can leave us a question if there's something that uh, is, is, is intriguing to you that you'd like us to kind of to, to visit. We'd, uh, we would love to do that. Um, but uh, now, now we'll get to get right into uh, to what we're going to talk about today. And uh, Charles, uh, Charles Sizemore, uh, Money Markets contributor, had, uh, had, had an interesting piece this week uh, on money and markets. I certainly encourage you to, to, to check it out. You can, you can see the link of it in, in our story notes with the, with the podcast. Um, but uh, he had an interesting story revolving around the V-shaped recovery of the, uh, of, of, of the, of the, of the market. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of different letters that are being associated with what the market recovery is going to look like. Is it going to be a W? Is it going to be an M? Is it going to be a Nike swoosh? Is it going to be a V? Is it going to be an L? There are, with the exception of S and O and, and, and T and a few others like that, there are very few letters that have not been associated with some kind of a, of a market recovery. Um, and, and where it goes, we really don't know. But I think Charles laid out a very compelling case for why the V-shaped recovery is simply not going to happen. Um, it's, it's, it's something that hasn't happened. It's not going to happen. It's wishful thinking. Um, but in, in, in realism, it's just not a, a, a probable solution or a probable outcome for, for what we're looking at in these, in, in these interesting market times. So I want to bring on our contributor, Charles, uh, Charles Sizemore. Charles, first off, welcome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on uh, today. And I, I want to talk about that. You had an interesting quote that I, I, I pulled from the piece. And, and I think it speaks um, highly in terms of, uh, of why a V-shaped recovery is just not, a, uh, is just not feasible. And, and what you said were economies need time to heal as businesses and consumers lick their wounds and figure out the next steps. I thought that in and of itself really just encapsulated the entire argument for why a V-shaped recovery is not feasible. And, and I, I want you to kind of elaborate on that a little bit more, but I think those words right there really just kind of hit home why we're not going to see a V-shaped recovery. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for having me on. And uh, it's funny, all this talk of, of obscure letter shapes for uh, to describe the recovery. Did you ever see that show it was on? I think it was on CBS called The Good Place. Uh, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? It's yeah, about four yeah. people that die and they think they've gone to heaven, but they've actually gone to a very diabolical hell where they're being psychologically tortured. Well, uh, on one random episode, they described the space-time continuum as being shaped like the, the name Jeremy Baramy written in cursive. And it was hilarious. It made no sense. It was, the whole thing was just a, you know, nerd joke. But uh, I, I, I thought about that. Uh, that that's, that's kind of, you know, where we're getting on some of this letter-shaped recovery. Um, you know, what, what exactly is a V-shaped recovery? It means, let's just play with the numbers here. Let's just assume we were growing at, let's just call it 3% a year. We weren't growing at that speed. But let's just say we're growing at 3% a year. Then uh, the economy crashes, so we, we get to the bottom of that V. That means we have to grow at 4 5 6% a year for a while in a hurry to, to get back up to that old trend line. And that's, that's V-shaped recovery. So um, Nike swoosh recovery or L-shaped or whatever obscure, you know, Roman numeral, Roman letter, Latin, whatever, you know, Arabic script, whatever we want to pick is the shape. Um, what's far more likely is, you know, that swoosh or L shape where, you know, we were going at trend, we dropped, we can resume the a trend, we can, let, let's say we go back to growing at 3% again, but there's that gap where you're starting over, you don't get this accelerated recovery right back where we started, and then you're, you're back on, on the old trend. Um, and I think that that's really it. You know, that, and that's not a bad scenario that that Nike swoosh or L, whatever you want to call it, that's that's actually a pretty good scenario, but it, it's definitely not this this unrealistic V shape. And it comes back down to uh, the economy is not just some 
you know, machine where you can just flip a few levers and, and it goes. It's the, uh, the aggregate decision making of millions of people, millions of businesses, and all of their interactions. And when you do have a major disruptive event like what we had where demand gets slammed because of closures, and then beyond the closures because of uh, you know, when, when companies are making less money or, or they've had to lay people off or, or what have you, uh, there, there's less demand, there's less money to be spent. And so all of this takes time to heal. Um, obviously, you can speed that process up with loose central bank policy, with stimulus checks, with, with whatever. Right? Like you can definitely speed that process along. But at the end of the day, you don't just snap your fingers and and re return to trend um, i look at my own i look at my own you know friends and family uh, everybody i know has spent less money over the last three months because you know things have been closed or whatnot but for people i know that run small businesses their their income has been affected and so they have scaled back they you know americans love to spend money that's not going to change it's, you know, the, the trend eventually gets, uh, gets reestablished. Companies react to uh, consumer demand and, and start ramping up production again, but it takes time. And to suggest that, I mean, if you, if you think about it just in mathematical terms, you know, to, to suggest a V-shaped recovery or that kind of a rapid recovery, the math behind that just seems extremely unrealistic just because sure. you're, you're looking at, you know, growth the likes of which we haven't seen even in a, you know, unless it takes, you know, 10, 15 years to get to that point. And we're talking about the possibility of this happening in one or two years. And that's just not, I just don't think that's. Well, not one or two years uh, from, from, from the sounds of things, it's one or two quarters, which. And that's just, and that's just not quarters. realistic. That's not realistic at all. I mean, I, I, you know, I appreciate the optimistic thinking, but let's bring it back down to realism here and, and understand that, you know, this is not, the economy situation now is not a, it's not a stock market problem. It's not, it's a problem the likes of which we haven't really seen. And it's because it's a health problem. Um, you know, we, we obviously there's other factors to it, but if you really boil it right down to it, this economy has, has subsided because of a, of a pandemic, of a health pandemic. And, well, and there's another thing, a cer a certain spending is just lost. Like for example, uh, we were all looking pretty shaggy for a bit there because we weren't getting haircuts. Well, you don't go get, two haircuts, if you haven't had a haircut in six weeks or three months or whatever, it's not like you go get three haircuts in one week to catch up. Like that, that doesn't work. I mean, like th those services are just lost forever. Um, if you go get physical therapy for a bad knee or bad back, whatever, you might resume your therapy, but you don't go do triple the number of normal sessions to catch up. You don't go to the gym. You don't, you don't get three gym memberships. You don't gorge yourself at a restaurant eight times a day to, to, to make up for all the lost restaurant meals of the last three months. It, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, I, I, maybe you know, there is some pent up spending. You know, maybe you were looking to get a phone upgrade and you put it off for three months and now you're gonna go get that new phone or that new car or a new shirt or whatever. Um, sure, like some spending does catch up in a hurry. Most does not, particularly for services. But yeah, because what, what you're saying is that you're, you're not, what you didn't spend over the last two or three months that we've been in a lockdown, you're not going to immediately go out and spend and even multiply that spend in a period of a month. You don't you're, catch up. Yeah, you're not, you're not going to do it. You you're might resume the old trend. You might go back exactly. to getting your haircut once a month or getting your teeth uh, looked at by the dentist you know, twice a year. Exactly. But, but you're, you're not going up. to, yeah, there's not going to be an exponential spend that would justify you know, a massive recovery in whatever you're doing. And, and that in your article, you touched on that, but you also led into something I found very interesting. And, and that is because of how, you know, how you're viewing the, the economy. And I think it's a very realistic view, by the way, um, that, uh, you know, the types of how investors can, can, can react to that is interesting. Your take on that was interesting. And that was that a buy and hold strategy may not necessarily be the best approach. If, if I understood the article correctly. So I, I want you to expand on that. And, and because buy and hold is most likely for the average investor is, you know, the most common, um, you know, yeah. strategy to, to invest in. And now you're saying that, well, this is not really the right economy situation for that to be, to, to, for that to be feasible. 
Well, sure. You know, if your time horizon is 30 years or 40 years, then you could make a case for just always being invested in equities, just buy and hold forever and you're fine. You know, let, let the long-term compounding effects work in your favor. But most people don't have a 30 to 40 year time horizon. They, by the time you actually have money to invest, you're usually in middle age and your window before you retire and, and need the money and can't afford to lose it might be 10 years, it might be less. So, uh, you know, when would you want to buy and hold? You might want to buy and hold after a major bear market has reset the clock and made stocks cheap again. If stocks are cheap enough, you may not care if they go a little bit lower in, in, in the short term because you may, be getting, you, may, you may be getting paid a nice dividend yield, for example. You know, there's reasons why buying and holding makes all the sense in the world. But what happened this time around was you had – Stocks went into the coronavirus crisis really expensive by historical standards. And, and you could de debate the finer points of, well, they should have been a bit more expensive than usual because interest rates are lower than usual, because bond yields are lower than usual, because tech is a bigger part of the indexes now and, and tech is fatter margin. So that should bring up the market valuations. Sure, there, there's all these reasons why stocks could justifiably have been a bit more expensive than usual. But they're at 1990s levels of, of you know, 1990s valuation levels, but by a lot of metrics, that really is pushing it. Now, you add to this, we just had the, the coronavirus deal. Stocks fell about 35%. They got a lot closer to, 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 to value price at, at that stage, but not, they never really got there. Like, like, like they, they never really got to that deep value range that brings out the, the real value guys like the Warren Buffetts of the world. In fact, Warren Buffett was selling throughout the, the rally. I, he, he, did, he never saw the, the value there. So, um, you know, what, what, does, what does that mean? I mean, sure, you, you can buy and hold here, but what do your returns look like going forward? When you buy at a high price, uh, your, your, your returns going forward, are, you might be looking at low single digits at best. If you buy after a major uh, correction, after a major bear market like 2009, getting in at that lower price, you may be looking at compound annual returns of 15, 20% going forward. So when you're at levels like today, the market may rally for six months, a year, two years, who knows, it may rally forever. But I, when you're getting in at these levels, you're not likely to achieve good long-term compounded returns. It's just, this is a bad entry point for, for, for long-term buy and hold money. Now, of course, if you're being tactical, and that's what I recommend people do these days, I recommend people take a more tactical approach to investing, uh, be a bit more of an active trader. If you can scalp a few percent here and there, if you can, um, if you can make a series of profitable short-term trades, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You can do that all day long. You can play the long and the short side. But that's when you're looking at valuations where they are today, this just isn't a time to be complacent, buy and hold and be done. This is the wrong kind of market for that. It's, I mean, I think, I think that's a, that is a very interesting perspective. And I think it, it would, it causes a lot of, you know, average investors to really stop and think, well, you know, what am I doing? Sure. You know, because, you know, like I said, because, you know, buy and hold is, is, is probably the most popular strategy amongst the average investor. That is, I'm going to buy X, Y, or Z or diversify my, my portfolio in whatever way, shape or form. And I'm going to buy it. I'm going to hold it. And then when I'm ready to, you know, take out those funds or I'm ready to you know do whatever with it, then I'm going to see where my gains are. Well, um, it, it, by the way, it was a fantastic strategy from 2009 until, until the coronavirus hit. I mean, that would I mean buying and holding throughout the last little over a decade would have made you a lot of money. Uh, that's fine. The, the question becomes how close are you to retirement? Uh, do you, are, are you investing by, you know, you don't drive a car by looking in the rear view mirror. Like that's, you, you get, you got to look forward. You get, you have to see what's coming, coming at you. And so using historical numbers like that may not give you the full picture. Uh, the future doesn't always look like the immediate past. And that, that's, you know, trends tend to stay in place for a while, but eventually they do break. And thinking of the, the way the market has reacted in the last three weeks, I think is pretty indicative of what you just said. I mean, just by the way it's fluctuated so much up, down, sideways, flat, uh, you know, it, it's just been one of those really chaotic type markets that I think it, I, to me is just trying to find its ground. It's trying to find where it's, where it's going to land. That's and a fancy word for that. 
price <laughs> discovery. Price discovery. Yes, that's, that, that's what's going on here. Like, like, like we're 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 all collectively trying to digest the information coming out. You know, what is the Fed doing? Um, how aggressive are they going to be on their asset purchases? What's this? What's the virus situation? Um, are uh, is another round of lockdowns possible? Uh, possible? Or if even if there's not formal lockdowns. Are there going to be de facto lockdowns because with the virus caseload spiking, are people just going to naturally stay at home and lock themselves down? Um, no one really knows yet. So we're all trying to handicap those odds. And until there's more clarity, you're just you're going to see this. You're going to see the market up big one day, down big the next as we're, 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 we're digesting the information and trying to figure out what to do with it. Now to, 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 to dovetail into that, and I'm going to steal a little bit of thunder here because I'm going to bring in uh, Money Markets Chief Investment Strategist Adam O'Dell here in just a second, and I'm going to use a reference that he used when we were going back and forth to talk about, uh, talk about today's show because I thought it was a great reference. I thought it was, I, I read it and I was like, that is dead on. And hey, Matt, can I interrupt you real quick? Sure, yeah. Just let me jump in before you get to that. I have some thoughts on buy and hold because, you know, Charles hit on a lot of great points. And, you know, I have this love-hate relationship with buy and hold. Um, I've published some, uh, some work on buy and hold before that shows, and I actually have a chart that I pulled up while you guys were chatting that uh, maybe we can link to in the show notes. But, you know, some of the problems with buy and hold are, first of all, it's very, it's enticingly believable. Okay. So if any investor looks at history and looks at a chart of the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, and they look back, um, you know, 50, 100, 200 years, uh, what they'll find is that over very long stretches of time, the stock market does go higher all the time. Uh, not all the time, but over that, that whole time span. Most of the time it goes higher. So that's why you look at that and intuitively, um, and, and the whole idea of the efficient market hypothesis does make sense. You know, It is intuitive to believe that the market is mostly efficient. So that's why a lot of people get roped into buy and hold. Um, the problem is uh, what, what Charles touched on is, is, is it comes down to the timing risk. How long do you have to be in the market? Nobody, you know, science isn't that good yet. Uh, nobody lives over 100 years old, and we typically need our investment dollars in our 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So you really don't have the, the holding period that you would need to be absolutely sure that you can be successful in buy and hold. You really have to hold stocks, buy and hold for 30 years or longer to have a guaranteed positive return. Um, so one, you know, one problem is it's enticingly believable, so people get roped into it. The second problem is it's highly dependent on your starting point. That's something Charles touched on. So the chart I want to link to, if we can later on, is um, a chart that I put together. It's a bar chart that shows um, the buy and hold strategy, how, how, much, how many dollars it's turned, uh, how it's gone from one dollar to, to how many dollars over certain periods of time. So for instance, between 1929 and 1943, one dollar inflation adjusted turned into just a dollar and eight cents. So that's a horrible return over a you know 15 year, 14 year period. Um, then the next period, 1944 to 1964, a 20 year period, that was a great time for buy and hold. One dollar turned into ten dollars and eighty three cents. So if you were lucky enough to start investing in 1944, you would be a firm believer in buy and hold. The next period was awful for buy and hold. So between 1965 and 1981. Um, one dollar turned into 94 cents after you factor in inflation. So again, that was a horrible time for buy and hold. And then the following period was actually good. So 1982 to 1999, one dollar turned into 11 dollars and 90 cents. So basically, lumpy is the word. Buy and hold is very lumpy. It works over certain 15 to 20 year time periods, and then over the following 15 to 20 time, 15 year to 20 year time period, it works awfully. So you really you don't get to choose as an investor where you start, okay? So most people, they go to school, they start their career, they save up money for cars and homes and children, and then somewhere in their 30s and 40s, they start saving money for retirement. Well, that's purely dependent on when you were born and when you start your career and when you start earning discretionary income that you can put aside. So, you know, you don't get to choose when you start, whether you start at the beginning of a good bull market for buy and hold or whether you start at the, at the beginning of a bad period for buy and hold. So it's highly dependent on luck. Um, just like Charles said, if you were doing buy and hold from 2009 onward, you think buy and hold is great, but that doesn't mean that buy and hold from 2020 onward is going to be great. So that, that's really the problem I have with buy and hold. It, it's very believable. It's enticing, uh, but it's extremely lumpy. It's based on luck uh, as far as when you actually start buy and hold. And, uh, and that's really why, you know, if you, if you need to commit your money, if you have 30 to 40 to 50 years, you know, so for folks that are listening to this, they're in their 20s, 
you can buy and hold. Even if you end up buying holding, uh, even if you end up buying in the market right now at a high valuation, you're probably still going to come out just fine 30, 40, 50 years from now. But timing risk is for the folks that are in their 50s and 60s and 70s right now. You don't have the time for buying and hold. So you do really need to look at more tactical solutions. I agree. I agree. I, I, I like the reference. And it, it, it comes down to timing and, 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 and where things stand. So I think that's, that's great. Now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add on to that. And like I said before, I, I'm going to use a reference that, that Adam actually brought to my attention. I thought was really, really good. I, I remember when I was a kid and, and, and Adam remembers this when he was a kid. I'm sure Charles remembers it when he was a kid. We all remember this when we were kids. I, I'm really old and senile. I don't, I don't remember childhood anymore. That's likely. Um, I can believe that. Uh, but, but you remember when you're a kid, and, and one of the best things that happens around May, June, now even earlier than that, but it's when you get to go to a baseball field and you get to play baseball. You know, whether you're doing it in a rec league, whether it's just you and a group of friends, or whether you are doing organized travel baseball that costs your parents thousands upon thousands of dollars every, every summer, you know, that is a fond memory that you carry with you. It's, it's kind of a rite of passage for, for both boys and girls, girls for softball and even baseball and, and, and boys for, for baseball. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, I, I was, I was a small kid. I wasn't, I wasn't very big. I was, you know, that, that tall and, and, you know, not much to me at all. It was just kind of a rail and, and you know, they didn't really make specified, you know, bats for, for kids that small back then they do now, but, but back then they didn't, it was, it was all, you know, one or two, three sizes. And that was really about it, especially if you're playing rec ball or church league ball or whatever you're into. So these bats, you know, in comparison to my size, were very, very big and very, very heavy. So, you know, the physics of, of, of moving the bat around and make contact on a pitch was next to impossible for me. Uh, so my coaches would always just tell me, choke up on the bat, choke up on the bat, and, and, and you'll get better control. And sure enough, it worked. I mean, you choke up on the bat, what it does is, is it, it makes a fulcrum point with the bat. I mean, I can go into the physics of it all, but, you know, I think we all get the idea. It gives you more control over your swing and it gives you better opportunity for contact on, on the ball when you, when you see a pitch. And especially in, in, in little league, when you have absolutely no idea what kind of pitch that the person who's your same age is about ready to throw at you. So um, it, it made sense. And, and then when Adam brought it up um, earlier this week to me and, and in the context of where we're going to go with this, it, it makes even more sense, especially when we're talking about why now is not necessarily a, uh, is not a good time to buy and hold because of, of, of how the market stand and how the, uh, how the economy is most likely to recover. And the way he brought it up was, you know, that, and, and this is specific to options. And Adam, if I get any part of this wrong, please tell me. I, I you know, I, I, I lean on, on, your, on your wisdom here. Um, and, and it is in terms of options. Now, th there's no secret. I like options. I, I, you know, I, we've talked about options a lot. We've talked to Mike Carr. We've talked to Adam about options. We've talked to Charles about options. We talk to options a lot and, and for good reason, because there, there are gains to be made for investors who play options correctly, who follow guys like Adam. And when, when Adam tells you to move on something with an option, you know, I would say hundred percent. Well, I, I'll say hundred percent of the time, you're probably going to make a, you're going to make a gain. Um, so he, it's worth listening to whenever he says to move and, and, and place an option trade. But it, since buy and hold doesn't really seem like a feasible, you know, potential in terms of an of a investment strategy, you still want to make gains. You don't know where the market's going to go. You don't know how it's going to go. We all know about market, you know, volatility and how, how up and down it is. But there is a way that even we talked about long term, how, how options can be used in a long term portfolio. But I want to shift gears and, and talk about how options can be used for shorter term plays. And this is where I want to bring Adam back into the mix because, um, you know, he is, a, he is an expert on options. He knows, he knows the stuff when it comes to options. And I, I want to take that tack and, 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 you know, you use that choke up on the bat. So I want you to kind of elaborate on that whenever you talk about how we can use options for shorter term wins and shorter term plays in this kind of a market out. Yeah, I mean, even before we get to options, I mean, that analogy popped into my head because we were talking about buy and hold. And so, you know, I played baseball growing up. My dad actually coached me in baseball. So happy Father's Day to all the fathers out, out there, by the way. Um, but he taught me, you know, he taught me all the, the fundamentals of baseball. And one of them was choking up on the bat. Uh, I was actually pretty tall for my age. But the way, the way he taught it to me was that, you know, sometimes you go up to the bat and depending on the score of the game and where you are at what point in the game, you know, sometimes you, you have the luxury to swing for the fence, you know, and it's a low probability swing, but if you get it, you, you hit a home run and, and you can obviously do well. 
Um, so if you're swinging for the fence, you want to you, you don't want to choke up on the bat. You want to have the full length of the bat to get your full amount of leverage and full amount of swing speed. And so, you know, you swing for the fences. And that's what I would equate to buy and hold. Look, if you if you have 30 to 40 to 50 years and you want to leverage that time, then get into buy and hold and just let it, you know, let it ride and you'll, you'll probably be fine. Um, at other points in the game, if like maybe it's, it's toward the end of the game and all you really need is a base hit to advance the runner from third to home and that's going to win you the game, then you don't want to swing for the fences. You want a more high probability play where, you know, you want to choke up on the bat, have a little bit more control of it. You're probably not going to swing the bat fast enough to get the ball over the fence, but if all you need is a base hit, if that's your primary goal, then choking up on the bat is a good tactic to, to use. And so, again, in my mind, the analogy is right now we don't know if buy and hold is going to be a good strategy over the next five to ten years. In fact, we're kind of dubious that it will be. So that doesn't mean you can't still be on the long side of the market. If you want to be on the long side of the market, my suggestion would be to – target a shorter window of time, whether that's two to three months, like we trade in options with Cycle 9 Alert, or whether that's just six to 36 months, uh, like we do in some of my other uh, Green Zone Fortune services where we're actually getting into stocks. But the point is, is, you know, choking up on the bat allows you to kind of target, you know, a smaller, more manageable base hit. And, uh, and that's really what you can do in this market. The mar market right now is choppy. We've got some trends, but we may not get the long lasting five to 10 year bull market that we've had over the past 10 years. So rather than trying to shoot for that uh, or swing for that, um, you know, just, just trying to get two to three months. I mean, even in this market, if you can get a stock move in over a one month time, um, you can do quite well. Now, where options come into this is that it's difficult if you're just trying to get a stock move correct over a one month period of time, it's difficult to make that much money. I mean, if you buy an ETF, you're not going to make that much in one month. If you buy a stock and, and intend to hold it for two to three months, um, you're kind of exposing yourself to that, that risk of a, of a bad earnings uh, reaction and, and getting knocked down from that. But by playing options, uh, if you get a move right over a one to two or three month period of time, you can use the leverage of this inherent in options to make good money. And so you can, you can basically try to make that base hit, but at the same time still score big because with an option contract, you know, it's very easy to make 100, 150, 200% in a month. Uh, if you get that move right. So like we just recently recommended, um, you know, a gene sequencing stock and within, you know, four to five weeks, we got the move we wanted and we made well over 100%. And that's really just not possible trading uh, stocks outright. It's not really possible trading ETFs. And uh, you can make good money faster than, than buy and hold if you can get the move right. And the other benefit of that is with options, you, you know your risk. You, you are, you're, you're fully aware of what your risk is. You, you aren't uh, going to lose any more money than what you're putting into it. And that makes it, you know, a relatively, uh, a relatively more sound uh, investment potential for, for especially the average, you know, the average Joe. Um, and, and you can read up on how uh, options work entirely. We've got several pieces on that on moneyandmarkets.com and, uh, and there's a lot, to, a lot there. Adam is a, a fantastic resource in terms of options as well. I've talked about that before. And I don't say that just to, to, to you know, to glorify or anything like that. He's really good. I mean, you, you read his stuff. He really has a solid understanding of, of how of how all that works. So um, hope you've got some good takeaways from, from what we've talked about today in terms of, you know, the V-shaped recovery being a bit of a myth, buy and hold, not necessarily being the right, uh, well, I'd say not necessarily, I think that's hedging a bit. It's really not a good thing. It's really not a good strategy to have um, at this point. And, and, and Adam just talked about how options um, can be a nice way to, to still come out ahead uh, even in, even in difficult market, to market times as we're in right now. So, um, a lot of stuff there to, to digest. Uh, you know, if you, if you need to rewind, rewind, because there's a lot of stuff to, to, to go over a lot of, uh, a lot of things you can learn from as an investor that you, that we, that we talked about today. And, uh, again, yeah, happy father's day, by the way, any, any dads out there, I think all three of us are dads. Um, so we can, we can kind of take that to take that to heart, but, uh, happy father's day. I, I will, I will personally say happy father's day to my grandfather who's in Atlanta. Uh, he listens pretty regularly, so, uh, no family bias there at all, but, uh, that's okay. I'll take it. Happy father's day to, uh, to him. And I appreciate all he's done. All the fathers out there. Great mothers as well. Can't leave you out. Happy mother's day uh, from back in May. Uh, maybe a little bit uh, you know, belated, but hey, you guys are, you know, mothers are worth it. So um, again, for uh, Adam O'Dell, Charles Sizemore, I'm Matt Clark. Uh, this has been the uh, latest episode of The Bull and the Bear. Check us out online, moneyandmarkets.com. And if you uh, go to our podcast tab, you can see all the podcasts that we've done. Uh, we're on YouTube as well. Uh, you want to watch a video of this, uh, you can. You go to youtube.com and uh, do a search for The Bull and the Bear podcast, and we're right there. You'll see the green logo. You can pull it up and see 
that. Plus, uh, we started some educational videos that we're going to keep rolling on and, and some other things that, that, that we have going on on our YouTube channel. Uh, check it out. Uh, and uh, if you're listening to us on podcasts, Apple, Google, Spotify, iHeart, wherever, leave us a review, leave us a comment, leave us a question, email us, the bull and bear at moneyandmarkets.com. And uh, don't forget, if you have the opportunity and you should do it, make sure you check out Adam O'Dell's Cycle 9 Alert. Um, it's, uh, it is a solid service. It is uh, worth your worth your time, worth your investment to check out because the guy knows the stuff for sure. So, guys, appreciate the time. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming on. Hope you guys all have a great, a great weekend. And until next time, safe trading.